that's just in case there are one or two people that are new here. Um, Sue joins us as a visiting lecturer, as a visiting professor for a year at UCL from the African Centre for Cities, and um, she's going to be dividing her time between the DPU, the Department of Geography, and no doubt other other places as well um, in in UCL. And we're very very happy to have her um, talking to us in three parts. Um, on African perspectives on urban development planning. And last week, if I could summarize in, at my peril in one sentence, um, I think what you gave us was a kind of political economy of, 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 of knowledge and, 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 and higher education in a sense, and research and academia in relation to, um, to, to Africa. Uh, talking about um, the asymmetries and the inequalities that exist in the way in which um, uh, knowledge is set up around around um, uh, uh, what are really going to be serious challenges in, in the urban future of Africa. Um, this week, our title is Current Urban Challenges, Future Directions, the Next 50 Years of Urban Planning in Africa. So, um, having really looked last week at the theory and ethics of, of the, and, and in a sense the framing of the topic, um, this week we, I think, are going to be looking a little bit more towards the future and looking at future challenges. So I'll hand over to Sue immediately, and as we did last week, um, Sue will talk for about 40 minutes, 45 minutes, and then we'll have some space for, for questions. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, you know, when, when you contemplate whether you're getting the theory right, um, you know, you sort of, there's always an anxious moment, and then you think about whether you are going to diagnose the contemporary questions appropriately, and, you know, project what are the big challenges for the next 50 years. Uh, there's a certain sort of ease, because of course you can't get it quite right, and fortunately I won't be here to tell whether what we've been talking about is uh, quite right or not. But um, what I wanted to do, just as we structure this, and, and, and next time we meet we'll, we'll pick up on, I hope, and be able to integrate this, this notion of big theoretical framings, the big political economy of who we are, what we do, and why it's important, with what you might want to think of as more of a kind of a meso-scale intellectual exercise that we're undertaking today, then down into some of, of what that means practically, um, um, and we can pick up on that. And so what I wanted to talk about is what, what I almost really, con the conceptual level as opposed to the theoretical level. In other words, you sort of have big theory. Um, and then I think that there's another place where intellectual activity takes place and is absolutely formative and, and critical in both relating theory to empirical investigation, but also in framing how we understand practical problems. Okay. Um, and so I think it's really... Some people just seem to have it. They, they pose questions in a very sharp way, in a very precise way, and they are able often to help us recognize when we have collectively, a somewhat lemming-like, gone over the edge and all asked the wrong question. And because we've asked the wrong set of questions, we've landed up in inappropriate places, and in fact, sometimes quite harmful places. And I said I'd talk about three things today. In fact. I don't think we're even going to have room for the two, so I've, I've narrowed that down uh, from what I said that we, we would talk about. And just as I did last time, I mean, effectively what I was trying to say is, is that we have to, as people based in the academy and as intellectuals engaged in policy and practice, it is beholden on us to sit back, to take stock of what we do and to think about the implications of what we do. That is a sort of ethical component, at least in part. Remember we said, the questions we ask have a, a strong ethical uh, component. And I want to do that even more specifically tonight, and I want to try and do that simply by showing two places where I'm partly 
stirring, um, where I think we may be going wrong. Uh, where, in fact, I think we are individually and collectively either asking the question in a way that I think is misleading, or in fact we are asking the wrong question completely. Okay, so you may not agree with me, and in fact I hope some of you don't, um, and, and we can pick up on that. And there certainly are other examples of this. Um, there, there are questions, for example, that we simply don't ask uh, anything about, and our failure to ask them, I think, leads us, and in 50 years hence, people will look back and they will judge that we have in fact failed uh, in particular kinds of ways. So, let's start with two that I think that we're asking inappropriately. And the first one is really, is, is the problem, the urban crisis that we talked about last time, and I'm talking particularly from an African country, <coughs> so I will deviate into the Atlantic and Indian and sometimes over the Mediterranean uh, into other contexts. Is the urban crisis that we are looking at really one of informality. Because if you did a, a simple Google Scholar um, search at the moment and you went urban informality, Africa, whing, lots. Okay? If you did something on urban segregation, Africa, you'd get a whole lot of stuff from the 1980s and not much else from the present. And, and some of what I'm going to try and show is that I think that we've, we're missing something. And similarly, I want to go to uh, the climate change question that we began to, to pick up on. Um, and to suggest not so much that we're asking the wrong, uh, that we, to suggest that we shouldn't be looking at climate change, but rather to suggest that the way in which we're doing it, hi, um, is inappropriate, misconstrued, and perhaps misleading in, in particular ways. And the reason for this is because we lack this conceptual clarity. And it's not a conceptual clarity that I think is an individual responsibility. It's a, it's a conceptual clarity that I think comes out of intellectual discourse. And so it's exactly, uh, Karen, for those sorts of reasons that I think forums like this are so important because what they provide is not just the conventional academic seminar, uh, but also one where we're able to ask the so what kinds of questions about does it matter, why does it matter? Uh, in particular kinds of ways. Proposition one. Um, basically, so, so my proposition here, and if you are a climate change person, this is, comes very largely from a piece that's just, just uh, been published in Global Environmental Change um, on the basis of some work that was done for Foresight, um, <coughs> which is a very interesting uh, body, and if you don't know their website, you might actually want to have a look at it. It's sponsored by the UK government, or it was until they had major cuts. Um, and interestingly, what they do is precisely to sit back and say, what are the big questions that we should be asking? Um, and as, I mean, for me, perhaps it's in, in fact exactly an example um, of what I think may be problematic because although I think they were asking the questions with really good intent, the way that the questions were framed set in motion uh, a set of assumptions, uh, a particular direction of research. And it's quite difficult then to counter that. And the paper which a colleague Ruani Wagawa and I uh, produce is, is in some senses a counter to that. And so basically what we argue um, is that the natural growth of urban populations is a much more significant driver of change and vulnerability in Africa than urbanizational migration, including climate-induced migration. So it's a complete counter <coughs> uh, to what the conventional work is saying. And let me try and tell you where the problem starts. You may or may not be aware of Myers's work. Some people say he said 700,000. Um, <coughs> in fact, I think it really was only 200,000, which is the estimate of the number of people he thinks will be affected by climate uh, in the African context. It's a lot of people. Huh? UK population is 65, 70. Uh, so 60, we're talking about three times the UK's population who uh, he estimates over the next very short space is will be affected is this, by climate. Is this 200, 200 million or 200,000? 200 million. Bigger right. pardon. Sorry? So next, I've right. lost the zero. Thank you. Right. Okay. But the point is, is that, I mean, he, he was just missed as this idiot. Um, you know, this is not possible. Um, basically, you can't simply take a sea level rise uh, prediction, calculate who lives in that area, and then deem that everybody who uh, lives in, in under that uh, sea level will have to move. Um, and the rural development people have been up in arms, making all sorts of points about 
you know, that's not how people adapt to climate change. Actually, people stay on their land. They may engage in circular migration for a while, but they come back again. So it's been negated completely. But what I think it has done, and what it's been part and parcel of, is a much wider way that the, the conventional climate community have connected with the development community, where the focus on climate change has been helpful in some senses, in that it's put the focus back on urbanization and migration. But the assumption has been that an adaptation focus would help stop the surge to the cities, and an adaptation focus would enable small-scale farmers to stay on the land. And in a sense, what that's done has been to feed what is a very pervasive uh, view in the African context, uh, which is of an anti-urban bias. We don't want people to come to cities, um, and we want to maintain uh, a peasantry in some way. Okay. At base, what global environmental change does, and in its most nuanced form, is make a case that there's going to be more circular migration. And again, that feeds into a very dominant narrative uh, of the way that Africans cope with development challenges. Now, the numbers are really important, particularly when you start leaving out zeros. Um, but they're particularly important when we begin to start saying that what we're going to see is major change. Okay? And as development planners, if you're going to engage in development practice, strategic planning, uh, community support, whatever it is that your, your professional life is going to entail, one of the things that we need to be doing is ensuring that we have some sense of what the big forces are. So it's that macro structural stuff that we were talking about last time intellectually, but here, just in terms of, of we need to get a response. And Africa's population is big. We keep saying to universities, and you may say it to, to your own, you know, it's great that everybody's making overtures to China, but actually Africa's population is almost as large. Its needs are probably greater, or are greater, and its capacity for response is significantly less. Completely embedded in that is the idea that what we have is the continent with the most rapid urbanization. The 3.5% is way higher than it is anywhere else. And so what we have here is, is the climate literature coming in and saying, yep, this is really important and it's going to be associated with the process of urbanization. By which they mean the movement of rural people into town. Or at best a process of circular migration. And the difficulty is, is that it's extremely hard given that the data that we've got is so bad, to counter that point of departure, to question whether that is really the case or not. And when you start to think of the vast sums of money that are going to be spent through the Climate Adaptation Fund, through the diversion of major development funds into climate, how we frame the problem is really important. Okay. It's just as we only heard the, the different stance on, on Pakistan the other day. You know, I happen to think it's probably not such a terrible thing. But if it announced the other day that all spending in Pakistan would go through women and children, uh, yeah, women and girls. It's the same sort of thing in the climate context. All funding will go to, in the African context, adaptation. And adaptation is coupled in many policymakers' minds with this notion of urbanization. And so I think what we need to be able to do is to begin to start interrogating. Don't worry, you're not supposed to read. The problem is, is that we actually really do not understand migration and urbanization in the African context. And if you have a look at the academic literature, there is no consensus. Okay? There's absolutely no consensus on what this is. So all, the, all this shows you is that some people still continue to talk about the push factor, okay? uh, the decline of rural areas, classic sort of Lipton argument, but they're much more updated uh, versions of that. The pull factor, that old-fashioned sort of stuff, but again, very, very much um, more updated versions of that with quite sophisticated analyses of the kinds of jobs that are available in cities that draw people into the labor market, uh, improved service deliveries in particular kinds of ways. Uh, but one of the most dominant voices has been somebody, um, Debbie Putz, who many of you may know from, uh, from King's, 
And Debbie's work has been particularly powerful, <coughs> partly because she's one of the few people who's undertaken any serious empirical work over an extended period of time. The difficulty of Debbie's work is that she works on one place, Zimbabwe, and it's a very particular place and context. But for me, one of the things, and if you have a look at her most recent work, actually, what is interesting is that even Debbie, who is always the doyen of circular migration, Debbie was the first person to really make the case that circular migration was a sustained, fairly widespread strategy which people adopted, in fact is now saying, actually, it's not really clear. What we do know is that people move in response to macroeconomic forces. And that's, that's a different argument from the climate change people who argue that they move in response to environmental forces. But we don't know. Okay. It's not uniform. Okay. And that we really do need to be careful as we begin to start framing those questions. And that's difficult. If you land up working for a big agency that's trying to set a large-scale agenda, the kinds of variations are not just regional, which is what, sorry, I don't have a, a pointer, which is what one would normally point, point out, okay, is that what's going on in North Africa is absolutely different from what is going on in Eastern Africa. But when you start looking across the variables of different bits of data, we also start getting a very different set of trends. Okay, so the hold on on us in setting the conceptual point of departure is to do that old-fashioned scholarly thing of trying to find out what the evidence is, okay? what the conflicting and contradictory evidence is. So the framing of the question uh, is one which is, doesn't just seek data, but is one that is informed by the literature and that is informed by the evidence that we have, bad as it may be, and we may want to begin to start interrogating it. Now, I thought it was really interesting when we start to do that <coughs> for... Uh, the question of urbanization in Africa, what we begin to start discovering is, is that it is true there are very different patterns for African urbanization. It's, it's very late. You, many of you would have seen this graph before, it's quite familiar. Yeah. And basically what it shows you is that almost all countries go through an urban transition uh, where the red lands are being more important than the green or higher percentage, that Africa's is much later um, and that its rural population is not yet declining. Quite as, as much as uh, others that, oh, you found a thingy. That's nice. Yeah, have it, Tom. Excellent. We're going to need it for the next graph. It's a tricky one. This graph for me was really interesting, though, because it begins to probe the question of is Africa's transition very different? And that's where it came out of. And what it shows, this is some work that Gordon McGranahan uh, did, is these are uh, population growth rates. So that's 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Yeah? The same one over here, not at exactly the same scale, so don't be fooled. Yeah, that's the percentage uh, growth. The dark hatching is natural population growth. How many, what's the percentage of the growth rate that we can attribute to the natural growth of the already existing urban population? In other words, how many babies did you have relative to? How many people died? As opposed to the overall, which is the product of? Geography 101, migration in from rural areas. And what is, emerges here is that Africa is really, really distinct because, and it's terribly unpopular to say this, and it's awkward post Cairo because we all pretend we don't talk about these things. This is about fertility. And African fertility rates are significantly higher, even in urban areas. Okay? They're declining very rapidly. But even in urban areas, they are very, very much higher. And this is, it's totally explicable. So you don't have to be a, a rocket scientist to, to understand why. And the slide gives you some of, of the pointers to, to where that is. As I already indicated, if you have a look, go back to that earlier table, you'll see that they're very varied and they change. And they are changing quite dramatically. <coughs> I had a lovely example just recently from South Africa, where they got the latest um, fertility rates. And Cabinet wouldn't believe them. No, 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 it's not possible. You can't possibly only have a 2.1 fertility rate for women in South Africa. We do. Okay. It's falling very, very quickly. And that's true in a number of places. Not true in West Africa uh, in, in the same kind of way. But why that is so important in this debate 
And why using this evidence to so begin to start thinking about climate change becomes, and whether we're asking the right questions about climate change is so important, is that what we are seeing is these very dramatic rates of urbanization and of urban growth. But they are not being caused by climate change. Okay. They are being caused by a natural increase in population of already existing urban residents. That's quite important if you're a climate change policy person and if you are an urban uh, development manager. And so it's really important to begin to start drilling down to start getting an understanding of what different <coughs> evidence is showing us. And asking questions about things like, is it environmental stresses and economic uh, stresses that drive? And the evidence that's beginning to be shown to us is that it isn't as simple. And when we, once we start drilling down into different kinds of data, we begin to see different things. Unfortunately, most African data is not good enough to be able to see the sorts of things you can see on this slide. And the importance of this is that what this does is it begins to show us a macro picture. Remember last time I said the problem with some of the theoretical work that we've been doing is that it's very focused on the household, on the individual. When we're able to scale back up, as some of these numbers do, we begin to start seeing some very interesting things. So green is the growth, the natural growth of population. Okay, so people who are second, third, fourth generation urbanites. Red is growth caused by migration. People who just come in from rural areas, and green, blue is the growth combined. So if you take my hometown, it's got a very high natural growth, fairly high natural growth rate, quite significant in migration in the middle there, and when you add them together, it's growing fast. Okay? Which is sort of what you'd expect, it's one of the major uh, economic towns. But if you take an example like this, okay, this is an area in one of the old homeland areas of South Africa, what you have is very, very high, natural growth, which is what you'd expect. This is a very poor population. But the red shows up migration. And when you look at what that means in total, that happens to be a place that's growing. But when you start looking here, when it drops down below, that means you've got decline. And when we start <coughs> interrogating data in this way, it, <coughs> it does mean that we are able to start asking questions of the questions. Yeah? And that's what we need to be able to do. If we're going to be starting to set development agendas, we do need to be asking about what if I'm wrong about the question? What are alternative explanations? So that we're not tautological in our assertion of the evidence. This is the same information uh, presented in a different way. Purple basically shows a net increase, green a net decline. And what it shows you is what you would expect. There's a massive concentration of growth along the coast, which is what you hear everywhere in the Greater Johannesburg area, and a massive out-migration from the countryside. Here the dots mean 100 people. Here it's done at a different scale, it's 1,000, and here it's 10,000. And all that's showing is you get a very different picture, depending on how you use the data. Okay, because in this picture, you'd think, what, where's the big growth? Here. This looks like the big growth area, okay, because of the way that we've represented the data. Whereas in actual fact, when we scale up and we start saying, let's just give one dot for every 100,000 people, where's the big story? Actually, the big story is the mega city of Greater Johannesburg. So you get a very, very different picture. In the context, oopsie, of the climate change debate, what this is revealing for is that what it's showing is that overall, the dominant driver of urban change is one of natural population growth, not one of migration. It's not to say migration is not important. Okay? It's not to say the experience of migration is not, in, is not influenced by climate change. But if you are sitting um, as a planner in the African context and you're starting to think about questions like, so what does all this mean for me? you're going to have a very different set of explanations. Amongst them is that most of the people for whom you are professionally responsible and with whom you are professionally engaged are not migrants. Okay? Most of them actually are already existing urbanites. 
it's very different if you are engaged in the global environment change stuff. And I thought to go back to Gordon McGranahan's work, which I think is particularly useful and good on, on, on this stuff, what he is able to do is to say, so what does this mean? And that's always a good way to test whether the questions that you're asking are the right questions. What is the way that the question that you have asked, what does it imply for practice? What does it imply for the actors that are involved in uh, your services? And what he basically says is that it's really not clear. But what is clear is the way that cities are managed will have a really macro-determining influence on where it is that people move. Okay, so, climate change is absolutely crucial. Is climate change the driver of urbanization? It might have impact on urbanization. No one's saying it will have no impact. But it's not the reason for us to resurrect the emphasis on urbanization. When we actually look at what the processes are, and urbanization is a critical process in the African context, understanding dynamics of fertility, understanding dynamics of demographic change are really, really important. And there would be all sorts of other examples of that. We may well revisit the question of the labor market, understanding that we've got a boom in the number of young people coming onto the job market. Uh, it would change things profoundly. And so the demographic question seems to me to be one of the things that we need to be including uh, in our informants to the issue of what are the right questions to ask as we face the next 50 years, partly because Africa is in such profound transition. Yeah? So that's a forward-looking one. What about my second uh, proposition? How am I doing on time? Okay? Got another 20 minutes? Yeah? Mm -hmm. okay. um, This is a piece of work that comes out of a range of different initiatives which I've been involved in and, and in the past I've been quite extensively involved in some work on segregation, um, partly because I'm a South African and partly because I trained as a historical geographer and you can't understand South Africa's past without understanding segregation. And you might think, oh God, these children in South Africans, they never stop, they're always on my race. Um, Thank goodness we've moved on and we can now talk about other things like informality, which is what dominates <laughs> literature. No, 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 I want to bring you back. I want to bring you back. And not necessarily to talk about race or colonialism. Um, and I am going to talk about the South African case, but it isn't about South Africa. Okay, so hear me clearly, and in fact it's not just about Africa, that I think that this has some reson resonance. First of all, let's just get some classificatory things out, out of the way. When we talk about racial segregation, there is a tendency in the urban literature to mean racial residential segregation and race. So, although there's no reason we shouldn't be talking about class segregation or ethnic segregation or any other form of segregation, and we could easily be talking um, about transportation or schooling or any other urban component, we tend to talk about racial residential segregation. I think it's a problem. It's particularly a problem to only talk about racial segregation because it means that in places like Africa you can begin to think that it no longer is a concept of salience. Partly because most populations are now 1995, 98. I was talking to somebody from the Caribbean the other day, 98% black. Segregation is kind of an irrelevant race, becomes a much less relevant uh, concept. Um, and it's not as important, many would argue, to talk about colonialism because there's so many other legacies that we now actually have to deal with. Part of what I want to do though is to say not just that the past continues to haunt us, but also that the inability to deal with the substantive form of inequality in the city means that we are unable to deal with problems like informality. Okay. So what I'm not saying is informality is a silly thing to be focusing on. Clearly, if you're going to talk about Africa, you have to talk about informality. What I am suggesting, though, is that the root causes of and solutions to pervasive issues like informality may well lie with our inability to understand and overcome some of the longer-term structural inequalities. And segregation 
is one of them. Now, there's no consensus on how to proceed um, in dealing with the past. Um, I have a tendency to prefer the Mamdani view, uh, which basically says our inability to reconstruct the local state to address the questions of the past means we can't move forward. But there's an equally powerful position put forward by people like um, Holston, which is that the pervasive and enduring negative impact of some of those past uh, ways of doing things, particularly modernism, uh, is the foundation for structural inequality. And so implied in that is the further we can run from it, the better. Okay. So I suppose I'm saying face your demons um, and let's work out where they are. And part of facing the demon for me has been the recognition that we've misunderstood modernism. Okay. We've misunderstood modernism in the African city in particular. And this is really important because what it means <coughs> is um, that we've singled out planning as a particular negative example of modernism. I have yet to hear anybody talk about how appalling it is that penicillin was introduced into Africa. How disgusting it is that we have modern rail or electricity in Africa. Okay. So lots of the advantages of modernism, many of the, the benefits of modernism are taken on board without critical reflection, okay. particularly in the medical field, but in the wider scientific field more generally. But when it comes to planning, <coughs> modernism is seen as the devil incarnate. And I think there's a reason for that. Um, and it comes out of a conflation of modernism and colonial town planning and land use planning in particular. Okay? Because what Europeans did was they introduced a system of land use management which was the instrument, the tool through which they subjected colonial subjects. Okay? So it's through zoning schemes, it's through individual tenure, individual property rights. And so in people's heads, colonial subjugation and modern scientific rational planning are the same. Okay? They are one and the same thing. And they certainly occur at the same time. The problem for me is that um, I have a different argument about how I think that actually ignores some of the more positive aspects of modernism. But for now, let's just stick with the idea that basically what this has done is that it's over-inflated the importance of the, the argument about modernism. Okay? And what it does is, in other words, because modernism is seen to be the root of all evil, we don't acknowledge that there are lots of other coexisting mechanisms which structure cities. Okay, so we focus on the wrong thing. See where my quick point about the focus on the question. What are we looking at in particular kinds of ways? It's just a disclaimer that I'm not saying that all cities are the same. I'm not saying that there aren't lots of routes to inequality. I'm not saying there isn't a macroeconomic context. But I'm just focusing here on the question of plan. And effectively, why the emphasis on modernism and modern time planning is so problematic in the African context is ironically precisely because it's not the only show in town. There are a hell of a lot of other things that are going on. Traditional authorities are absolutely significant in allocating land, in determining where infrastructure is put, in uh, in making decisions about investments. There are significant illegal systems, mafias, if you like, which determine who gets the right to put up the spaza shop, who gets the right to the garage in particular kinds of ways. And systems of planning, of which modernism is only one. Okay? And the modern town planning systems, and the colonial town planning system is only one of those. Okay? And the Siphon case for me is a really interesting one because I think it reveals it particularly clearly. Partly because uh, the old white apartheid state was the exemplar of what colonial planning could deliver to an elite 
and how easy it was to oppress a majority population. But in the post-1994 period, they got rid of <coughs> everything that was supposed to be associated with that scheme. Nonetheless, we continue to have parallel overlapping systems. And so from that, I've got some suggestions of why re-looking at uh, the South African case as an exemplar of why it may be useful to go back to look at modernism and to look at it in a slightly different kind of way and through looking at modernism and segregation that we might begin to understand inequality very differently uh, in cities. And the first one is that, so it's ABC, I've got three points. Um, in moving to think about inequality very differently and the problem of segregation, because all cities remain segregated. Think of an African city you know. Okay, get, get one in your head. Unequal? Yeah. Some of the most unequal cities in the world are African cities. Okay. They're not without elite spaces. And the conditions of the poorest of the poor are vastly different from those of the rich. And part of the problem is, is that national governments have tended to avoid, because they're not interested in cities, they've tended to avoid engaging with a planning system that works for cities. So that's the first problem. It's an urban bias. There's a, there's a reluctance to, to be biased towards cities. And as a result, there's a failure to deal with their specificities. And as a result, what we land up with is at least dual, and in fact it's probably more than dual in many cases. In other words, it's not just two systems. There are probably three or four parallel systems which entrench privilege and perpetuate segregation, sometimes racial, but more often than not in the post-colonial context, a different form of segregation in particular <coughs> kinds of ways. And then finally, what these parallel systems mean is that there is no unified form of enforcement in any particular way. So it's different rules for different people. Let me just give you some examples of that. So in the South African case, basically, if you have a look at the post-apartheid uh, reform of, of, of land use planning, which has still to go through Parliament, it is the only piece of legislation which has not, the only sector which has not been fundamentally reformed in the post-1994 period. And part of the reason for that is the Land Use Management Bill remains unpassed, keeps going backwards and forwards, revised, <coughs> reconfigured. Is it's written for the yellow spaces on the map. If you remember that <coughs> earlier map that I showed you, there were no people there. Okay? It's written for a rural context. It doesn't take cognizance of uh, what goes on in cities. And as a result, it simply doesn't work there. And this is very typical almost everywhere in Africa because addressing urban problems is seen as orienting resources to where wealth already exists, to places that have uh, Western orientation. And the anti-urbanism that one, and there's quite a nice literature that's beginning to emerge about this time, I think you picked up on this question last time when we began to, <coughs> to talk around the question of why is it that there isn't an engagement with, with the urban? We talked about to national elites and who, whether somebody would want to be a mayor of a city or move into a national political party. But so there are a whole lot of reasons why there's a reluctance to engage with the detail of urban reform and a happiness to leave in place those segregated legacies of urban regulation and control. And under those conditions, it's extremely hard to overcome segregation. And of course, implied with what I'm saying here is that segregation is the twin of informality. Informality, informality, the elite part of the city, the poor part of the city, the informal part of the city, the poor part of the city, the elite part of the city, the formal part of the city. They're two sides, to some extent, of the same coin. And the problem for me with stuff around informality is that what it fails to do is to begin to engage in any substantive kind of way with what the technical details are. And these technical details are important, and I don't have to spend a long time talking you through them. Uh, but suffice it to say that even in South Africa, having removed uh, the racial terminology 
and practice in particular land use controls, what we continue to see is that there are very different traditions. And some parts of the city continue to be zoned under something called the Less Formal Establishment of Townships Act, which was a fast tracking which you see right across Africa. The part of the city allocated to be where there are lower standards, where there is no commercial development, where or no formal commercial development and therefore less lower levels of infrastructure, where banks won't lend money because it's not private property. So there are a whole range of different ways that that manifests. Sometimes it's in communally controlled areas, but the point of that is to say that parallel, because parallel systems continue, uh, we get very differential uh, ways of allocating development and different ways of enforcing. I like the photograph, but it sort of seemed like the hand of God coming down to enforce. So that's how I thought it. And basically, it's the argument that you may have heard before, which is that, you know, if something isn't separate but not equal. Yeah? It's, it's around the importance of a uniform system of enforcement of the controls around uh, land development. And there's a whole range of reasons why people give uh, for fostering an, a single or at least an integrated system of enforcement, something which doesn't happen. And the basis of, again, of informality is the idea that there are spaces where the state doesn't reach, there are spaces that the state doesn't reach equally, there are spaces where there is no concern uh, to enforce. And this idea of a single uh, system of uh, land use management is the one that it seems to me comes out of a concern to end segregation, to end the treatment of people in different ways. And when we begin to start saying, how would I like to be treated in the city, regardless of whether I was born in a formal or an informal, in an illegal or legal settlement, and you start to begin to think about the overall system of urban management that you might want. You don't want to commit yourself to a segregated form because as soon as you do that, you may well land up in that part of the city that is the lesser uh, of the two. And so it seems to me that uh, in moving forward, that it's these fundamental questions that we ask about what do we do about cities? How do we understand the future? What's happening now? And how does, we, how does the way that we frame our understanding of the present impact on the interventions that we will make which will determine the city form and the city experience for our grandchildren. So, thanks.